You're listening to the Casting for Fun podcast, the show that talks about entertainment, sports, music, and inspirational stories for all to enjoy. We're glad that you could join us today. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Now, here is your host, Albert Pineda. Welcome, everybody, to the Casting for Fun podcast. I am your host, Albert Pineda. And joining me tonight on this really cool episode are two really cool friends of mine who I haven't talked to in many years. So I'm really excited that I had this opportunity to talk to them tonight. Uh, Mike and Lisa Kidd. Lisa, Mike, how are you guys? Hello. Hi. Oh, I guess technically Lisa Swan, right? Yeah, technically. But I still go by Kidd. I just use Swan to hide from people. Okay. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining me tonight. This is very exciting. Uh, you, you both made Dragon Flicks so awesome for me and high school was so great at Temple City High School. I'm really fascinated to hear the stories that you'd have to share, how both of you are now teaching at the high school, which is so awesome. And, and just take the, the time to reminisce and uh, reflect back on our time in Dragon Flicks, which I think would be really fun. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Very Sounds cool. Good. Uh, So actually, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to ask now. Uh, So Mike, you've taken over Dragonflix for Miss Dunn. Uh, Do you have uh, news on how she's doing now in her retirement life? So I took over from her in 2001. I think it was 2002. She actually retired. Okay. So we've been 20 years now out. Um, But no, I still have been in contact with her and she's still doing really well, still loves animals um, (laughs) and, and doing great. Awesome. awesome. I know she was a very uh, special teacher for all of us, uh, a very important mentor for you, especially since you've taken over uh, her job, which is really great. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lisa, so uh, same question, but for Mr. Hollinger, uh, I didn't know Mr. Hollinger as well as, as Corky. Uh, I only had him for one one year at graphics, but he was probably one of the coolest teachers ever at Temple City High School. In fact, if I remember yeah. correctly, I think you referred to him as a campus legend when you initially <laughs> yeah, took over for him. I- he, he, he was a campus legend. I mean, he had the unknown surf band and like, Boss I don't know. t-shirts. Yeah. He was just really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I took over for him eight years ago. Oh, okay. And how, how's he doing in his retirement life? He's doing really great. He's living his best life, like mm-hmm. surfing and camping and doing all that kind of stuff. Like I still see him walking around temple city cause he lives a couple blocks away. Oh, awesome. Very cool. That's good to know. Good to know. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm very interested in how this came about. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you guys planned it, like that you would both end up teaching at Temple City High School. I mean, obviously you, you started doing it first, Mike, but so I, I guess if you could both take turns telling the story of how you came about to be teaching first, Mike teaching uh, Dragon Flicks and then Lisa teaching graphics. So I'll go ahead and start. Um, for me, um, out of college, I, um, I obviously... Um, at that point, realized that I wanted to be a teacher, and I really wanted to keep that entertainment side still in my life. So I was kind of looking what opportunities that I could do that in. And so my first job was at Saint, I'm sorry, Gabrielino High School, and um, I was teaching math there, and I was also involved with their drama program. And kind of in the two years I spent there, I just it's just not the same level at that time in particular, it was not the same level of program as Temple City. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you don't sometimes realize what it's like other places. And if you're in a really great, you know, theater program, you know, and you're look at somewhere else trying to start from scratch is just really, really difficult. You know, nobody's interested. Nobody wants to come to your show. Nobody wants to support your you know, program, you know, try out audition, whatever. And I kind of just, I missed that. And so when I had the opportunity to get a job at Temple City and realized I could take over the theater program there, I just, that was, that was an easy decision for me. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. It's kind of interesting because I've never really, I've never really thought about it, but like our journeys were like kind of slightly similar in the fact that like I was working at Edgewood High School in West Covina Uh and it was kind of a startup high school. So like I started on the ground floor with like the freshman class as they began that high school. Um, and I really missed the traditional high school setting uh-huh. um, because at Edgewood, it was a very small academic school of like about a thousand students. Um, and we didn't have a football team and we didn't have cheerleaders and we didn't have much of anything because we were just a startup high school. And I really missed those things that 
I had had in high school. And so when a position opened at Temple City, I, I immediately jumped for it so that I could have that kind of programming that I really felt like was what kept me in school as a kid. Very cool. That's awesome. Uh, I'm curious, though, was there competition? I mean, was it uh, applying easy? Were you able to just uh, jump right in and take over? Um, I don't know. I actually, I want to say that first year at Gabrielino, I even got offered a job at Temple City. Um, and at that time, I thought, no, Gabrielino's good. I'm going to, you know, found it here and make it happen. And I actually passed on it. Oh, really? um, and it wasn't until that second year that I said, OK, yeah, this is we're two years in now and not much better than where we were two years ago. And so that's when I decided to kind of make the switch. Um, one of the things that's very fortunate is being a math teacher. Um, if you're any halfway decent at teaching math, <laughs> finding a job is not that hard. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, mine was really different. Uh, cause I, I have my art teaching credential, um, and art teachers are like dinosaurs. Um, very few of us exist anymore. And in order for a position to open, somebody has to usually die, um, oh. we kind of die in our position. We never retire. Uh-huh. Um, and so I, I started at Edgewood high school and I taught there for six years before I left over to come to Temple city, like before something came about. And it was really a fluke that it, that that position came about and, I just jumped as fast as I could. So I was really lucky and it was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, I'm glad that you both get to, to work, work there. It's really cool. So I imagine you get to hang out often as, as you can, right? Uh, on campus. Yeah. yeah. Students think we're kind of weird because, uh, because we're siblings um, and we see each other all the time. And then we actually live next door to each other. Um, so we like see each other all the time. Um, and so it's, it's, it's entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Lisa, I wanted to ask you about the, the Vans competition that you were doing with your students. Was it last year or the year before? The, the Vans custom It was culture? last year. It was during COVID. That's right. That's um, right. It was, uh, it was really intense. So, like, for those of you that don't know, every year the Vans Shoe Company runs what is known as their custom culture competition. And it's a competition specifically for high school students um, to design Vans shoes. And so um, it's a pretty lengthy process and uh, it starts with just applying. Like you just kind of apply and they put all of your names in a hat and then they draw, you know, X amount of contestants contestants to Mm -hmm. participate in the program. Um, And then from there, we had to submit digital drawings of the shoes that we intended to design. Mm -hmm. And then if our shoes were good enough, then uh, I think it was the top... 50 schools got shoes to paint. And so it was like this very large tiered kind of project. And I had a a group of five students that were really uh, gun ho about it in my advanced graphics class. Uh Um, And so once we got the shoes, it was kind of difficult because I had to drive to everybody's houses and drop the shoes off um, because it was COVID. Uh And then we had to They had to send me links to art supplies and then I would have to like Amazon them to their houses um, because they, they did them hundred percent virtually. Oh, and so then once, once we had all of the shoes painted, um, we had five pairs that were painted. Only two of the pairs could advance to the next kind of level, so to speak. Um, And those were the ones that were submitted to Vans. Um, And then it was just, it was such a crazy ride. Like, I look back on it super fondly, but uh, it was super stressful. Um, at the same time, uh, COVID was really hard, and I really wanted my advanced students, in particular, to have something. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of felt like if I could, if I could somehow make this happen, that it would make the year worthwhile, and that they would have something to like walk away with and feel accomplished. Um, so I was like really lucky. Um, I super put myself out there on social media. Um in a way that I normally do not do. I don't think I've even posted on Facebook since then. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I called every single person I could find um, to try to get us publicity and try to get us the votes that we needed to get to the next level. Um, and I had a really great student like social media campaign that they ran through my Instagram account um, that you know really kind of propelled 
the voting of the shoes and stuff. And it was really great. At the end of the day, we got $15,000 for the school, um, specifically my art program. And then the two kids that painted the shoes, um, uh, Kathy Yee got $10,000 scholarship uh, for Cal Poly Pomona. And then Catherine Ruan got a $5,000 scholarship to Claremont McKenna. Oh, good. So it was really helpful for them too. It was really great. I still have the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's a wonderful, great experience. I'm, I'm sure it was, even though if it was stressful, I'm, I'm sure it was really great experience for I, you. I applied again this year because I just thought I really want to win first. Um, she, she first said, she said, I am not applying again. That was the first <laughs> thing she said for about a year. It's true. But then I kind of felt sad about it. And so I applied again this year, but I, I wasn't drawn in the raffle. Oh, so we I'm didn't, sorry. we didn't make it okay. on. So, you know, maybe next year. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I have kind of an unusual question for you both. And I, I feel like I should know this going back to high school days back in the, the mid to late nineties. So both of you are really big fans of the shoe brand of Vans. Uh, why <laughs> is that exactly? I mean, Vans are, are excellent shoes. I love them too. But, but, but again, Lisa, your collection's massive in your closet. It, it is. <laughs> it is very large. <laughs> I don't know if you know that my collection is actually larger. It's oh, true. no, I didn't know that. He just doesn't Mike. take pictures of his closet. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I'll tell you exactly how it started. Uh, in the l- mid-90s, a new shoe came out on the market um, called the Air Jordan. And uh-huh. everyone was buying Jordans. All the cool kids had their pumped up kicks. Uh-huh. And uh, Vans took a big dive at that point in time. They were still being manufactured in America. Costs were rising. Um, And I'll be honest, I didn't think they were going to make it. And so at that time, uh, don't forget too, they also were not in malls. They were in standalone brick and mortar shoe stores. And so it was really a big transition of whether or not they were going to survive this or not. And at that time, to get a pair of checkered vans, their signature shoe was one of the hardest shoes to find because that was not Air Jordan style. Like, you know what I mean? It just wasn't what was trending at the time. And I remember at one point I was calling shoe stores out of a phone book, trying to find any pair of shoes that I could get. And, um, and, you know, just not, you know, not, not good, not good, not good. And I remember a student of mine brought in a, a, paper catalog from some random shoe brand company, you know, and, and they had pair of checkered vans in there. And I remember, well, crap, I better buy some, I better buy more than one pair because this might be it. And so I bought like two pairs of checkered vans (laughs) because, because, you know, that would be a lot. And basically it started me where, you know, that went on the shelf. And then the next time I saw a pair, it was a different color. So I bought that one because I, you know, better buy it. And I just started building up the supply unknowingly at the same time, um, Vance had finally figured out how to remarket and rebrand themselves. Um, I think at that time, Tony Hawk was now kind of becoming more of a um, cultural icon. Yeah. Because um, I think it was a video game. Now they say that. Yeah, I um, think it was. And, and so then that kind of, okay, brought them back again. And, and they came back. But at that point, I had already had, you know, 10 pairs of shoes and it just it kept going. And then the other thing that helped is I found the outlet stores, which just always carried the wacky and weird one offs yeah. that are just kind of fun that you don't get anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Pizza vans. The pizza vans. <laughs> Awesome. I love that your stories are always so more exciting than mine. Like I just, I had an older cousin and I thought he was really cool and he always wore vans. Like I don't have any really good reason. And then I just, I don't know, over time, like, I feel like you kind of become a caricature of yourself. So like over time, I just started amassing mad amounts of slip on vans and like now, now look at me. (laughs) So with the rise of the internet, are you able to find the more custom brands that you're looking for or custom styles? I, I mean, I guess they're out there, but I'm still shopping in the outlet store. Oh, I'm always looking for the, what nobody else wants, you know? And then all of a sudden later it's what everybody wants. See, I'm different. I get really obsessed with like the art vans. Uh And so sometimes you can't get them. And then I have to go to the internet. Like I tried to buy the Van Gogh vans the day they came out and I could not, they sold out within about 30 minutes of the like release of the shoes. Oh wow! And so then I immediately started scouring eBay because 
it was like near and dear to my heart. I must have the. She's still the art teacher. Like, I <laughs> must have them. Very cool. Very cool. It's good to know. I mean, again, I, th- I felt like I should have known that, or maybe you had told me that story back, back in the day, back then. <laughs> that was the first time I've ever heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I don't feel so bad then. <laughs> okay. So go- reflecting back to that time. So like the, the mid to late nineties, that's when I was in high school and that's when I was in Dragon Fix and met you both. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity just to reflect back on that time. Uh, I know Lisa had the opportunity to listen to my, my conversation with Peter. I don't know if you've had that as well, Mike, but it was really fun for me just to talk to, to Peter and reminisce about that. Uh, what were your, some of your favorite memories of those uh, mid to late 90 musicals that Temple City High School did? So of those, of those musicals, you said? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, back down, looking back now, it's kind of like the golden years. Oh you know God, what I mean? So like uh-huh. the things that, for as a teacher now too, the things we did and the things that we got away with and the things that were like expected of us are so like not even close to what would happen nowadays. Um, I just, just, just kind of weird things and rules. I, I remember at one point, I think everyone on crew had a pocket knife. Oh, you had to. That <laughs> and was you had problem. to have a pocket knife. Uh-huh. Um, now, oh my goodness, you would be expelled if you brought up a knife anywhere near anything but back then that was just the expectation that's just what you needed to do the job Mm -hmm. um and so it's just just very different oh my gosh we used to get out at like midnight oh yeah i remember that's right you would get out so late at night and like go home and go to school the next day and like that's just not the way of of it it's just not the way it is anymore there are rules now Mm -hmm. Uh, i think about i think about like chris bowman taking us into the catacombs and telling us ghost stories i remember that yeah i I mean like just things like that that they're so near and dear to my heart uh albert Mm -hmm. you'll love the uncle john stories oh yeah still rampant Uh it's one of my favorite things to talk to students about like after they've gone to the civic to come and be like hey did you like they tell you about uncle john like what they tell you did you see uncle john like i got that story i I like the the, like there are certain nostalgic things that are still there and like being a dragon flicks kid like you can still like talk to the kids in in that that way but i don't know man those were the good old days oh yeah here's my story about that um probably one of my first two, three years as a teacher now on staff doing this musical, um, we had a very weird phenomenon where um, in one of the seat, we were recording the musical and in one of the um, scenes, you know, it was, a, it was a house and it had a second floor and there were some drapes. Well, all of a sudden behind the drapes is the shadow of a human figure. And it's kind of one of those like, you know, it's in the corner of the, you know, viewfinder. You don't really like, you're not paying attention to that. But in post, you're all of a sudden looking at that being like, wait a minute, what the heck is that? And then we're like thinking like, well, there's no, there's nothing behind that set piece. There's nothing that could have physically been there. And so it started this whole rumor of like, oh my gosh, that we've seen this ghost. This ghost is in the video footage. And so anyway, this rumor was going around with the students and a colleague next door, um, called me in one day and said, Mr. Kid, Mr. Kid, all of my students are all talking about this ghost that apparently is in this video. Can you please tell them exactly what was, you know, what is going on? And her expectation was I was going to set them straight. And then I went in and be like, yeah, totally. It was the ghost. (laughs) And the crowd, the students all are screaming, like, we told you so. And she's like, I can't believe you said that. And it was awesome. I have to tell you, I look back at those times at the Civic and like those times we were doing not just the musical, but like any of those shows. And I think of like our, our, like just the copious amounts of free time that we had to be kids. And like, and that, that I think is the coolest thing that I think about. I mean, like those, those, I mean, it, it bonded us all. Like, I mean, to this day, I still remember all of the stuff and antics that would go on backstage and all of the games we would play and like all just the things that we would do to waste time. Cause we were there forever. I yeah. mean, forever and unraveling Christmas lights. And I still cringe when I see Christmas lights. Like, I, I mean, it's just all of that stuff was so cool. I mean, so cool. It absolutely was. Yeah. Uh, do you guys remember the, the, the mayor's, uh, stomp chant that we would do the start mm-hmm. of the show. Oh, that's still, still that happens. Still happens. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad that still happens. <laughs> still happens. 
Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Uh, Mike, I had a question for you as you have taken over the class and are you know, essentially leading everyone there now. Uh, Peter and I discussed it briefly when I got to chat with him that uh, from our generation group, Lisa was the only one who was uh, talented enough and maybe even mature enough to handle stage manager. <laughs> so I'm wondering, since then, has there been other students that have risen to the ranks, risen to the occasion to be stage manager? So actually, we've kind of doubled down a little bit on that. Um, when I started, um, it was still rare to have a student stage manager. Uh -huh. Um and so it was, we were still kind of, I think, figuring out, but somewhere around, I want to say 2004, five in there, mm -hmm. um, after the passing of our friend, Chris Bowman, um, uh, one of his friends, Sharon Alexander, who was a stage manager at Disneyland, came to us to kind of help us out with our program. And basically what happened is she turned into our stage managing coach. And so that we had now a person whose dedicated job was to work with our stage manager and, and prepare them um, to do that job and really to prepare them professionally of what it takes to do that job. Mm -hmm. And kind of since then, it has grown and grown over the years where, you know, back then we'd have one person who maybe was a stage manager. Now we have about three kids, mm -hmm. a stage manager, two assistant stage managers. Um, and our track record is amazingly well in that students we've turned into professional stage managers now. Um, I oh, have awesome. students who are calling shows for Cirque du Soleil. I've got a, a, more than one at Disney, at Fox Studios. Like it's really now become much better a program with that extra effort that we put into it. Oh, that, that's really awesome. Good for them. Very cool. Very awesome. Mm -hmm. um, what did I want to ask now? Uh, I wanted to ask what's going on now uh, there. I mean, I, you know, it's actually kind of perfect timing that, that we're talking about this right now. If it not for COVID, uh, this past weekend probably would have been the spring musical weekend, right? Yeah. Yeah, it would have. So, so what's going the, on with Dragon Flicks now or what's been going I'll on? I'll talk about the good parts, season. okay? Um, mm -hmm. So prior to COVID, one of the things that we had done was there was um, a regional music theater company that started... Um, basically an awards program, a competition for high school musicals. Mm -hmm. And they're called the uh, J. Ray, John Ray Awards for Youth, and it, also known as the J. Rays, which, um, and they went out and would um, adjudicate different high school musicals and then give out awards for them. And there was usually about somewhere between 10 and 20 schools competing, many of which were performing arts uh, high schools, magnet high schools, that type of thing. Um, and we actually would then uh, compete with them and we're really some years more than others, really fortunate in winning awards. Our last particular year, we did amazing getting best crew, best, best stage manager. Um, we got a special recognition for our projection, projection design. Um, and so, you know, it's been really a great way to help us kind of showcase our talents um, and, and where we kind of compare with other schools. Um, and then now kind of post COVID. And I don't know if your um, listeners know that um, our show was shut down um, the day the world shut down. Um, we were supposed to open um, on a Friday night. And I think it was that Friday they shut the school afternoon, Friday. they shut down the schools and said, everybody go home. Um, Newsies, right? And Newsies. so say that again. Was that for Newsies? You guys were doing. Yes, Newsies that was that for our, our show yeah. Newsies. And that particular that. show was pretty much the best one I think we've produced in the last it, 20 it, years. It was amazing. Um, it, certain people had the opportunity to see it in the dress rehearsal and I, it was going to be great. The yeah. show that never was. The show that never yeah. was. Yeah. So anyway, so that, that was really heart wrenching for us. Um, and it also was a big financial hit to us as well. We basically had paid a, all the money to mount the show and then got zero of the ticket revenue from putting on the show. Mm -hmm. And so it really has put us now in a position to be to make it very difficult to move forward with the next thing. Um, so where we are now two years later is um, our school decided that, especially during the the uh, last swing of COVID we had, um, that it was best to push back our musical from March, maybe into May when times would be healthier, which looks like that was probably a good call. And um and because we're kind of limited in our ability to do things right now, we're starting with a kind of a smaller version um, uh, called Annie Jr. 
and it is the kind of junior version, a smaller version of the musical Annie, um, but still with a uh, live orchestra, still with uh, you know our, our great crew and all that. But, and, and at the Mission Playhouse. And also, okay. yeah, at the Mission Playhouse, still kind of on a grander scale, um, is what we are planning on staging right now for, I believe it's May 27th. Oh, awesome. Very cool. I was actually going to ask that too. I'd be, well, Peter and I were talking about that. I would be very much interested in coming back to see the the, the old place. It'd be really awesome. I, I keep forgetting that it's the Mission Playhouse now, not the San Gabriel Civic. But. <laughs> yeah, there's a, <laughs> a, there's a few of us that like say Civic and the kids are like, what? And I'm like, Playhouse, the Playhouse. playhouse. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So actually, I wanted some clarification, too, if you, you would probably know this better than I did. So I had heard that it was the summer of 2020 that there was a fire at the mission. Was that right? I believe, yes, there was a fire at the mission okay. um, that um, is next door to the mission playhouse. Yeah, um, that's like, I don't know, 150 years older. Um, and I think it burned the roof down. And I think they're in the process of restoring that right now. OK, but it didn't affect the playhouse itself. Correct. It did not okay. affect the playhouse. Okay, that, that's what I had heard. But again, I haven't actually been in that part of town in years. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, very cool. Very cool. So one last question that I had, uh, I remember that back, back I want to say yeah, in 2002, I got to see the, the retirement party for Ms. Dunn. And then you were, guys were really pushing for, for movies, which again was another really awesome aspect of Dragon Flicks that we haven't really touched on. And I remember that uh, Matt Calamia and some of his friends had put together a Star Wars versus Matrix movie where he actually had like the, the special effects to create lightsabers. I thought that was just mm -hmm. fantastic and amazing. Uh, are, are you still also pushing that as well with Dragonflix teaching uh, uh, film production? So usually I direct the class every year based on the kind of desires of the students and what they want to accomplish. Uh -huh. And I've gone, for example, with we used to make a video yearbook um, and that has uh, I want to say I started up again and then it kind of went away and then the students brought it back again. Right now we went away with it. Um, we've had a lot of students recently that were way more live theater. Um, mm -hmm. And so we pushed a lot doing, you know, live theater. And again, our goal too is we want students who want to work in these industries to now have a doorway to going into them. Mm -hmm. And so we've had a number of students do that, but um, I want to say probably in the mid two thousands is when I was a lot more, um, film and movie heavy. Um, and those students, you know, had a much bigger interest in movie making. Um, uh, one of my students um, went on was to a, be a director. Um, she worked, I know the, her last big project I remember was she was a unit director on the TV show Castle. Oh, awesome. Um, and then I, you know, another, my probably most famous student um, who actually did not go in the directing route. She has gone down the acting path, believe it or not. Um, her name is Sherry Cola. Um, she is on uh, Freeform Network's uh, television show, Good Trouble, as well as she's in a lot of different things if you check out her IMDb, IMDb page. Um, but again, she really got her start by kind of making the movies in our class, doing uh, some of the fun projects. Um, um, and kind of that gave her some of that on-screen time to kind of figure out, I think, her comedy and comic timing. And she then parlayed that into the next thing, into the next thing, into the next thing, um, and is doing doing really well right now. Yeah, it's been fun to watch her grow. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. That's uh, it's exciting to hear that the the uh, current generation, actually, uh, they're probably doing better than, than we were, which is pretty exciting. And another fun one is I have a lot of students, too, because my point in class really now is if you want to work in Hollywood, why don't you? you like we live in Hollywood. If anyone's going to get a job there, why can't it be us? And so I have a lot. And I, I always tell my students, too, like, sure, you're probably not going to be a director. You're probably not going to be an actor. But there are so many jobs that you don't even know exist. Um, and go look at them. Go find them. And I have one student who works for NBC. Her job is selling NBC products to foreign countries. And apparently I didn't realize this. She told me like a lot of the foreign um, shows are produced by NBC in Hollywood. So they're, they're filming, you know, the American Idol Taiwan or whatever, you know, oh my God. in Hollywood or whatever it happens to be. You know what I mean? Uh, sorry, it would be Taiwan Idol, my, my yeah. mistake. But, but, the, but it was like, I didn't even know that was a job. And that's literally like her job is to sell that. You know, I have another one who's just an accountant and it's like, well, why not? 
So yeah, I really encourage students to, to go out there, look, and, and like I said, you'd be surprised what opportunities there are out there if you're willing to go chase it down. Awesome. Very cool. That's definitely something uh, everyone should consider and look into. Uh, I think that's all the questions I have. Was there anything else you wanted to bring up, discuss, talk about? Um, no, just, uh, just I, I really, really happy to see you guys. Uh, again, I know Peter, for example, helped out with us when we were doing Newsies. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just, it's just uh, really great to see um, kind of what's developed from that, that group of people that, that Lisa said, we were all hanging around doing stupid stuff together. <laughs> um, and I think it, it really speaks to the fact that, that that's kind of what that program's about, uh, is bringing people together to do things. I think Absolutely. a lot of people forget that um, it's all those extracurriculars in high school that really helped develop your personality and it helped develop your skills and it helped develop all of those things that you actually need as an adult. It wasn't really the English class and the math class. It was all those other classes that really taught you those social dynamics that you need out in the real world doing whatever it is that you're doing. Like I, I I'm just, I'm really all about the extracurriculars. <laughs> no, no, as me too. Absolutely. As, as an elective <laughs> teacher. <laughs> like. No, it's, it's absolutely very important. In fact, I, I talked about it with Peter on our show that I, my freshman year I had was in sports and I wasn't very good. It wasn't really cooking for me. So uh, my thought after that was to really not just do anything. But then Jared Kloss was the one who told me, hey, sign up for Dragon Flicks. I think you'll like it. And I ended up loving it. Uh, and I developed a lot of the skills that Lisa had just mentioned. Uh, so yeah, e extracurricular, you, you really should be doing it. You should be going home, uh, only after it gets dark at school. <laughs> yeah. A lot of kids <laughs> think that like, you have to just, you know, do math and English and whatever. And I kind of remind them, I said, no, the best kids do it all. You, you uh -huh. need to do it all. That's what life is, is doing it all. Like mm -hmm. if you can only do one thing at a time, like definitely don't become a parent. Like, no, no, it's, it's just. <laughs> You can't say no. You just keep going. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, I guess we can go ahead and wrap up for tonight. But uh, thank you both so much for coming on my podcast. This was so much fun for me. And I would love to do it again in the future sometime. Maybe even uh, get additional uh, Dragonflix alumni to join us. I think that'd be a really fun conversation. No, anytime. It was really great, Albert. I'm so I'm so happy that like you're doing so well and that this is what you're doing. It's, it's just really awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I love it. Uh, family's doing well, healthy. We're all doing great. So thank you so much. Okay, well, thanks for tuning in to the Catholic for Fun podcast. Uh, Lisa, Mike, thank you again for joining me so much. Thank you. Thanks.